So today's lecture is about uh, 3D modeling. And kind of the reason that we need to do this first is I want to talk about generative models for 3D. But in order to do that, we kind of have to understand, like, how do we even represent a 3D object, OK? And so we'll talk about some of the standard ways. And then we'll talk about the super exciting new technology that came around about three years ago called NERFs, Neural Radiance Fields, OK? So um, today's lecture is basically 3D representations and NERF. OK, so um, the tricky question is how to represent a 3D object, right? So, so far, we've been mostly talking about images, right? So images are pretty easy, right? We have a discrete grid of pixels. And then every element of this pixel grid, you know, gives me some sort of RGB triple, right? There really isn't a more natural way to represent uh, images than just as a grid of pixel values, right? So with 3D objects, things are a little more complicated. There are several ways that we could represent or collect 3D objects. And then each of those has kind of corresponding pros and cons in terms of if we want to later use that representation for generative modeling. OK, so some representations are good for certain things, and some are good for other things, right? So there are, um, you know, in contrast, several ways to represent 3D. Some of them I'm sure you've heard of already, and some of them maybe you haven't heard of. Um, and also, the, the right way kind of also depends on whether we're looking to represent the 3D for like a single object, like you have an object on your desk and you, and you want to basically represent the single 3D thing, versus if I want to capture a 3D environment. Say I'm standing in front of this classroom and I want to capture a 3D version of the room, the type of representation I use may be not the same thing I would use for a teapot on my desk, right? So the most natural extension from image to 3D is what's called a voxel grid, right? So voxel grids are, in some sense, the most natural extension of images, right? So instead of having the simple uh, 2D image, we extend this to a rectangular solid of voxels, right? And so the obvious kind of pros of this sort of thing is that it immediately extends itself to kind of everything that we could do with a 2D image, we can really do with a 3D voxel grid also. Um, and so kind of the pros of this are kind of like this Euclidean evenly spaced structure naturally extends to all these existing neural network techniques. So we can, you know, semi-directly extend 2D techniques. And in particular, you know, a natural extension is like convolutional neural networks, right? So you can imagine that instead of having a kind of a 2D receptive field for convolution, you now have a 3D receptive field. And so if I go to um, just an example, like one of the first uh, attempts at doing something like this was called 3D shape nets. And this was in 2015, kind of before a lot of this generative AI stuff was happening, right? Um, and so this was by Wu et al. And so this is just kind of an example of showing how I could take a 3D object and I could kind of represent it by a series of these 3D convolutional layers where I have now kind of this idea of like you know size and stride in not just two dimensions, but three dimensions, OK? So that's pretty natural. Uh, and that was, that was used for a lot of 3D uh, kind of just like not generative stuff, but just like kind of 3D deep learning algorithms. Um, but on the other hand, it's not really the best or the only representation for 3D objects. For one thing to think about is that, you know, let's suppose that I just take a kind of a slice through this thing. So I'm looking at kind of like, um, you know, the the voxel grid from above. This is like kind of a top view of one slice. You know, unlike an image, a 3D object has this notion of like 
free space and occupied space, right? So for example, if I'm thinking about a, uh, you know, like a blob, like a, you know, section of this, these black voxels here are basically, you know, on the 3D surface. You know, these things here are basically like empty voxels. And then there is a bunch of like voxels that are kind of like fully inside the object that we don't really care about, right? So these empty voxels have no color. These, you know, voxels on the surface may also have an RGB color. And then these voxels here may be like interior voxels that we don't really care about what happens there. They're not visible, right? So that's one thing that we don't have in 2D is this notion of visibility, right? Um, in a 2D image, all the pixels are visible all the time. In a 3D image, you know, there are some voxels that are visible only from certain perspectives and some voxels that are inside the object that are not visible from any perspective, right? And then we've got this notion of 3D space. And so there's also kind of like this idea of, you know, if I want to represent a detailed 3D object like a human head, I have to probably have a pretty small grained voxel grid, right? So there's a kind of a computational storage aspect of saying, you know, I have to split up this, you know, 3D world into say like millimeter sized voxels and your head takes up a thing that's, you know, like 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. It's a lot of voxels, right? Now there have been definitely a lot of innovations in like computer graphics to more efficiently represent this voxel grid volume. So for example, if you know anything about a computer graphics, you may have heard about something called octrees, right? Octrees is basically a way of saying, subdivide the 3D space and spend all your time in places where the 3D object is actually occupying space and the places where it's not occupied are just like big empty octree grids, right? So there are ways of, of doing it with that, um, but that's not really the typical way that you, that you use voxel grids for generative models either. So I will come back next lecture to some 3D generative models that work on voxel grids. But one of the ways that voxel grids are often used is via what's called an implicit function. And we're going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes, which is a more natural way of using voxel grids as opposed to just modeling the surface. So this is kind of like representation number one, OK? Representation number two is point clouds, OK? And so in a way, this is a very natural way of representing a 3D object because it's the representation that most naturally comes out of a physical scanner to scan 3D objects, right? So what you get is basically, you know, a cloud of unstructured points, like a set of unstructured points. So um, this is like an unstructured set of X, Y, Z points. that represent samples on the surface of an object, right? So the advantage of this is that if I'm scanning someone's head, there's no notion of free space. I'm only distributing points around the surface of the head. And I can imagine a you know, RGB color attached to each of these points that I can then use to create um, you know, uh, things. So the pros of this are that this is typically how real world 3D scanners operate. So in my other life as a researcher, right, uh, there was a time where I did a lot of work with 3D scanning. And so we have this, uh, you know, this is actually a pretty old scanner, but this is called a LIDAR scanner. Um, it was, it's often used in kind of like surveying and the visual effects industry to create very you know, fine detailed versions of buildings, right? So we used to take this scanner out to lots of places on campus and we scan these buildings. Uh, you know, here's an example of kind of like a, uh, cannot play media. Why can you no play media? This is like a, this is a problem that I had actually. So let me make sure I can play this for you here. Um, what the heck? I was playing in my office and now I can't play it. Maybe I'm just gonna restart PowerPoint here for a second. Um, so let me go back to my notes for a second. Oh, and I think maybe I remember what the problem was here. It's like the worst thing when you have like a beautiful lecture set up and then something messes it up. Okay, so let's try this again. All right, here we go. 
And I wonder if I actually do this uh, in the slideshow version, will it actually work? There we go. Right, so here's an example of kind of like this virtual fly through around the VCC. And the cool thing is that these LiDAR scanners, just as a side note, can be like millimeter or submillimeter accurate, right? So even though we're, you know, hundreds or well, maybe like 100 meters away from the surface of this building, we're still getting like brick level texture on this device, right? And so um, other ways of acquiring media along these lines are like structured light scanners. And so, like, um, if you've, well, this is actually still more like a, a spinning. Mirror. So like there are three scanners on cars, maybe not necessarily like Tesla's, but like the Cruise and the, Wemo, and the Waymo devices that you see driving around the streets of San Francisco have probably some sort of LiDAR scanner that are finding pedestrians and objects. And then, um, you know, this on the right is kind of a picture of a movie set. Like uh, I have a whole bunch of pictures of the movie set from Thor, right? Thor basically set up this whole like little town in New Mexico in the middle of nowhere that then they 3D scanned all the buildings so then they could use that to virtually destroy the buildings later on in visual effects, right? So for more information on this type of application of 3D, I could talk about it all day. You can look at the, video, the videos from my visual effects course. Um, I also have like a handheld structured light scanner. So this is for my visual effects course where we can acquire pretty accurate models of uh, you know, people's heads and kind of like tabletop sized objects. And so this type of thing is pretty common for, um, you know, real world physical object scanning, right? And if you ever used like the uh, Kinect device or something like that from Microsoft, that's a 3D scanning technique that's either based on time of flight or structured light and generates these point clouds. And so this is just kind of a picture showing on the left is like a voxel grid representation. On the middle is the point grid point cloud representation, right? So the pros of this are that it is kind of easy to obtain. It's a natural representation of 3D data. Um, there's no information that's spent in places where there isn't any, you know, 3D surface. But on the other hand, you can imagine that since this is an unstructured point cloud, it is harder to apply neural network type techniques to it, right? So the cons of this are that unlike a well-structured voxel grid, um, you know, it's less natural to apply like neural net techniques since the data is kind of irregularly spaced. And also another thing about this type of data, just as a side note, is that, you know, if you look at this image, for example, and this is not really, I mean, you, you can fix this with different kinds of scanning, but, you know, a lot of times there's artifacts in this data that make it hard to deal with in terms of, like, glass is hard to scan. So you see here, like, there's no return on this glass window. If you have an object that's in front of the scene, the LiDAR array, since it's a visible laser beam, can't penetrate solid objects to see what's behind things. So you end up with these kind of, like, shadows of things that are produced by foreground objects that are including background objects, so you have to get multiple scans. Anyway, that's not really you know, the LiDAR scanner's fault, that's just the way it works. But it does mean that there's not this like very nice structure, like the points that you get out of a 3D scan with this method, you can't guarantee they're nice and even, is what I'm saying. Um, and a bigger mathematical issue, for example, if we're generating objects or comparing objects, is that since there is no like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 direct ordering, like basically any reordering of these points is the same point cloud, right? So you have this issue of like any permutation of your data is the same image, right? The same 3D object. And so, um, you know, any permutation of data is the same object. And obviously, you know, if I took a, an image and I permuted all the pixels, I wouldn't get the same image anymore, right? So we don't have the same sort of sense that this is point number one, this is point number two, and I can directly compare these points across different things. So several generative 3D algorithms are based on point clouds. I don't want to give the impression that it's impossible. We're going to talk about that in the next lecture, but just giving you some sense of why it's a little bit tricky, right? So the third natural representation is a mesh, right? So the right-hand bunny here is a mesh where we've got, again, vertices similar to the points you might get from a scanner, but now we're connecting those vertices into faces and edges, right? And so certainly a mesh is the most standard way of thinking about 3D data when it comes to things like, you know, 
video gaming and computer graphics, right? Like all of your you know, games are optimized for fast rendering of 3D meshes, right? And thinking about which triangles are facing the camera, which ones are occluded, stuff like that. So this is, you know, basically, if I'm thinking about, you know, just, just uh, you know, a collection of points, I have a bunch of 3D points, and these are typically connected into triangular faces. And the way I store this data is I number the points, and then I have a collection that says, okay, the location of point one or the location of vertex one is like an XY location. And then I have eight such vertices. And then I collect these vertices into faces to say, okay, the first face is formed by a triangle going from point one to point two to point four. And then I have however many faces, right? And so this is, again, very favorable in some applications, right? Because it's a very compact representation. You get explicit connections between faces that then you can texture the faces and you can you know, render them. And like I said, this is like what the graphics pipeline was designed to do, right? Um, so you know, the pros are that you know, basically the, the graphics rendering pipeline is designed for this. The cons are that it's even harder to make meshes work with neural networks, right? Because um, kind of even harder to directly apply kind of like standard neural networks. Because the underlying representation is complicated. I've got this list of vertices, another list of faces, and those two lists are different, you know, like, um, Again, we have the same issue of trying to compare different things that have different permutations. Um, there are ways of doing it. So for example, you may have heard of like graph neural networks. Well, this is like a graph on a 3D you know, point cloud. So it is possible to deal with. But as we're gonna talk about next time, most generative 3D algorithms are not really operating on meshes either. It's probably operating on either point clouds or the NERF representation we're gonna talk about. Uh, and of course, it is possible to kind of like translate back and forth between any of these representations in some sense, but I'm kind of most interested in what is like the underlying fundamental representation. So getting a little bit closer to what we want to do for generative 3D is what are called uh, implicit or sign distance functions. And this is a cool idea, and this is kind of the, the first step towards NERFs, right? So the idea is to think about a, a function that takes a spatial coordinate as input and maps it to some number, okay? So that's what's called a field. So a field takes a spatial coordinate and maps it to a number, or more than one number, right? So for example, I have a function that for any x, y, z I put in, I give you a value, right? And so one example is just like the gradient, right? The gradient of an of a image is a vector field, right? At every point, I get a vector that points in some direction, and I can evaluate that at any x, y that I choose, right? You spend a lot of time probably in like third semester calculus talking about like Stokes' theorem and Green's theorem when you talked about, like, if you're a physics guy and you've talked about, like, heat flow in a, you know, in a bar that's subjected to heat at one end, that's also a field, right? So basically anything where I can evaluate some sort of quantity that is based on space, that's just, a, that's just what it is, right? It's just like a function, right? And so here's the clever idea, right? So suppose that we wanted to represent a sphere in 3D, right? So let's consider this function here. Okay, so for any point in 3D space, I can evaluate this function and get a number, right? And so, again, thinking about this kind of like from the, from the top view, just like the z equals zero plane, what's happening? Well, that's like saying that if z equals zero, then I'm just looking at this. So anywhere on the unit circle, I'm getting 
a value of this function that is equal to zero, right? So here, the function on the surface is exactly equal to zero, right? Outside this here, the function is positive, and inside this here, the function is negative, okay? So the idea is that this single function implicitly represents the sphere. What I can do to get the sphere back from the function is to ask where is the function equal to zero, right? So the idea here is that the zero level set, the place where f of x, y, z equals zero, gives me the sphere surface. And again, here's a quick example from, um, actually from my image processing class. So let me go back over here. So right, so here, here's an example on the left-hand side. I have a function, right? It's this colored surface. At every point x, y, I have a, a, a value of that function. And so then if I ask on the right-hand side, well, where is that function equal zero? I get this R shape. And as I move the surface up and down, so here I'm moving the function down. Eventually, I totally miss the R shape entirely. As I move it up, you know, I move through the, the number that I want, and then I eventually get some other shape, right? But it's a zero level set that I really care about. And the cool thing is that you know, this zero level set can represent a shape that has an arbitrarily complicated Thing, right? So for example, this R has a hole in the middle of it. And if I think about trying to represent that as a, like I mentioned, this is a 3D R. If I had a 3D thing, I'd have to think about, okay, so uh, I have to somehow mesh around this hole. You know, I could think about things that might be a little bit of a pain to, to represent. Like suppose that I had like a, you know, like a coffee cup. Right, that kind of goes down into here. So you know, imagine that I'm trying to, to make a triangular mesh out of this coffee cup. Well, then it has to kind of be very thin. It has to go around the thing. It's got a hole in the middle of it, right? Um, and so this would be kind of a tough type of shape to represent fairly with a point cloud or with a you know, voxel grid. I mean, it can be done, but the implicit function is a very elegant way of doing this. And there are other applications, like I was just at a PhD thesis defense, where they were talking about doing like you know, segmentation of like bones in the jaw, if you got multiple objects, you know, you could also represent, you know, an object that had like multiple pieces in the same single implicit function, right? And so it's a very natural thing. This, this thing could be like, you know, have, could have some holes and stuff in it. And so, um, you know, that's a kind of a, a clever, elegant way of representing a shape. And if you know the kind of history of segmentation, back in kind of like the early 2000s, you know, sine distance functions and implicit functions suddenly became a very appealing way of modeling stuff. And certainly, I remember that, you know, if you think about like the, the synthetic water that is created in movies, for example, you've got the ocean waves and there's huge froth and there's like bits of like crap flying off the wave. You can think about that as the zero level set of some function instead of having to model every bit of froth that comes off of the wave and think about how many triangles do I spend on each of these little bits, you just have one function that does it all, right? So it's a very cool idea. Um, and so this is explicitly called a sine distance function because this basically is telling me for a given point how far away is x, y, z from the surface. So it's literally the, the distance I have to go to get to the surface, right? You could in, theory, you could in general just have any function that equaled zero on the surface of the object that you care about, but not necessarily be a sine distance function. That's just more generally called an implicit function. Okay, so in general, um, you know this is very flexible. So this is like prose, very flexible. You can kind of easily represent objects with arbitrary topology. And then it's you know possible to extract surface after you're done with, you know, for example, if any of you ever took computer graphics, there's an old algorithm called marching cubes or sphere tracing. Like there are easy ways to extract the object once you've got the function that you want, right? So um, 
and also the, the other thing is that it's evaluated on a grid, right? So basically, I could take a voxel grid and I could evaluate this function at all these places, and then I could interpolate those function values to get the surface that I wanted, right? Using what's called an isosurface algorithm. So it's kind of still got a somewhat nicer three dimensional structure. Okay, so these four things, right? Uh, voxel grid, point cloud, mesh, implicit function are kind of like classical ways of representing 3D shapes, okay? So the next innovation in the world was called neural fields, right? And so this is what is leading towards NERF. So a neural field is just fundamentally a function like this that is parameterized by some sort of complicated neural network, right? So it just means that my F is not so easy to write down. So a neural field in general is just a field parameterized by a neural network, right? So I could imagine, for example, that I could take an input spatial location, pass it through some complicated neural network, and get a number that, for example, could be the value of a sine distance function, right? And so that could be something, you know, I, I'm not going to draw the whole thing, but I could imagine that I have some sort of like, you know, fully connected MLP kind of thing, and then what comes out is D, right? So I could, you know, I don't know why I spent the time to draw this, but you know, you, you see how it goes, right? So I could have some sort of like thing, and then what comes out is D, and this could be, for example, like a multi-layer perceptron, right? So NERF, the neural radiance field, is kind of like this, except the input and the output are both a little bit different than this, right? So it's not just space coordinate comes in and some function value comes out. So we're gonna put a pin on that for three minutes and then I'll tell you about what nerfs are. The last thing I wanna say is that there are a bunch of other hybrid functions or hybrid representations of 3D that people have suggested, right? So, um, you know, let's just say that there are so-called hybrid representations So one possibility is kind of something called a, a triplane. This was a neat idea. There was a paper uh, by Chan et al. I think I have it on the web page, where the idea was that you basically have like uh, three planes. Think about the best way to draw this. This is really taxing my drawing ability here. I feel like this could have been better. So basically, you kind of have like you kind of have like three planes, right? And what you do is you have a function that will uh, estimate the location on each of these uh, perpendicular planes, and you kind of find the x, y, z point where those three points intersect, and then you put that thing through some sort of a multi-layer perceptron, and then you get this field value. So it's kind of got this combination of a neural field and a kind of a weird way of representing the 3D, right? I don't wanna talk about this too much because it's not like right down the main road. The other kind of um, thing that I came across was a paper called Shape Assembly, which is actually, um, if you're thinking about constructing a solid shape, you could think about it as a set of instructions like draw a rectangle, you know, from here to here. Now draw another rectangle from here to here, right? So you could kind of like build up, if you wanted to build like a chair, for example, you could build up out of primitives that were, you know, kind of like these pieces and you, you describe the shape fully in some sort of like assembly language, basically, which is kind of a cool idea. So basically you describe shape as a series of instructions, which surprisingly was shown to work in this one paper by uh, Junes et al. from SIGGRAPH Asia. Again, I think, the, I think the link is on the web page. Okay, so the thing that took the computer vision world by storm was NERF, right? So um, basically 2020 was the year of NERF, which stands for Neural Radiance Fields. <laughs> 
And this was by Mildenhall et al. In ECZV 2020, although this paper was disseminated and well known like well before it actually was published. So people were already starting to use NERF before it even officially was published. It appeared in an archive and people just like went crazy about it, right? So every year there have been like dozens and hundreds of NERF papers, right? So for example, in 2023 alone, I heard that there were more than 170 NERF papers in one conference. And that's like more than all the papers that are in SIGGRAPH, right? So it's like you could have like an entire conference that was nothing but NERF, right? Um, and so what is it, right? So here's the idea. What we're going to do is we're going to create a 3D representation by taking an object or a scene and looking at a bunch of images of it, OK? And then we're going to learn how to make an image of that scene from any other perspective that we want, OK? So here's the setup. We start with a collection of RGB images, just normal images. Let's call them I1 through IN of an object or scene. I'm going to say object, but it doesn't really matter. We can use it for a scene. Um, and so you could acquire these images with your phone, for example, right? And so a lot of NERF algorithms are as simple as taking your phone and hitting record and moving around the scene that you want and then sending it up to a, you know, an app that will compute the NERF for you, right? So, and that's what I want you to do in homework five in some sense, right? So if we want to compute a real object, we can do that. Of course, if we want to generate a three-year three representation of a synthetic object, like something we made in a game engine, we can use you know, the game engine to make whatever synthetic views of the object that we want. Right? So there are a lot of Nerf papers that are also like using entirely synthetic images because I can easily create those as opposed to having to go out and collect them. Right? So generally, you kind of want to have good coverage of your object. Right? So if this is like your scene or your object, You know, you kind of want to move around the object, taking pictures that are kind of like around the 360 degree periphery of the object. You know, not just necessarily even from the equator, but you can kind of get above it, move around it. So when you're creating your own NERF, you want to remember to have good coverage, right? So, you know, you want to be able to see the image from all the perspectives that you think you might want to then re-render that image from, okay? And so the idea is to now represent this scene as kind of an unusual function. And the function is going to be a five-dimensional function. So what are these five dimensions? So the idea is to represent the scene as a continuous 5D function. Make it clear this is a five that outputs two things. The radiance emitted at each direction theta phi at each point x, y, z, and so that's the first thing. And the second thing is what's called the volume density at each point x, y, z that controls how much light gets through that point. So I'm going to write some more ways to think about this in just a second. But the kind of fundamental idea is that, you know, suppose that you're trying to make a, a nerf of, of me, right, holding this thing. So, you know, the, the thing is that depending on, or maybe I should, like, hold this. Uh, I can't get it off of the thing. Yeah, all right. So you know, here I'm holding these kind of like transparent and shiny objects, right? So depending on where you're sitting in the classroom, it's not like every point in this 3D space is going to have the same color 
for each observer, right? So some of you may be getting a glare reflection off of the surface of this calculator, and some of you may be seeing different colors of my shirt kind of distorted through this hand sanitizer, right? So it's not like I'm a Lambertian surface, which means that I'm not emitting the same color independently out at any angle. The, the view that you have of me depends on your viewing direction, right? So that's exactly what this nerf is trying to say, is that what I want to do is for every point here, I want to know how, you know, does it look from a given perspective theta phi, right? So I have a point x, y, z, and I have a direction in 3D theta phi, right? And that's telling me what kind of, you know, color is coming out that way, right? And then I also have to know in order to render this thing, I have to know, you know, what's going on along the ray between the observer and the 3D point, right? So you know, if this is a window, then I can look right through the window into points inside the object. But if it's a brick wall, then it has no transmissivity at all, and I stop looking at that point, right? So that's what these two things are controlling. And so again, let me write this in a slightly more comfortable way. So the idea is that I have a location, x, y, z, and I have a view direction, theta phi. And in practice, you know, I could, I could modify this to be a 3D unit vector d if I wanted to, right? These go through a big, the way it was modeled originally was a big multi-layer perceptron, which has parameters, uh, actually, I guess I, could, I shouldn't call it theta, I should call it something else, p, let's say. And what comes out is a color, which is a red, green, blue value, and a volume density, sigma. And so this sigma is only between 0 and infinity. So it's a positive integer. And basically, it's saying that you know if sigma is big, I have low penetration. It's like an opaque point. And if sigma is small or 0, I have high penetration. Or if it's totally 0, I have free space. And so what I'm doing with the NERF is I'm learning a function, let's call it f, parameterized by p, that maps x, y, z, theta, phi, to a point, or a 4D value, RGB sigma. And like, like I said, the cool thing about this is that it is explicitly encapsulating the fact that the image will look different depending on where you're standing, right? Where the viewer is critically changes the way the object looks, right? And that's something that none of these other algorithms, like meshes and point clouds and so on, could come close to handling this kind of like transparency, translucency, reflectivity, stuff like that. I mean, I guess one way to think about this is that the lighting that you take the object in is kind of baked into the scene, right? So there have been papers, and we'll talk about that a little next time, that allow you to relight the nerf. But the way you should think about it for, for today is that you're capturing a scene or an object under a certain kind of lighting configuration, and you'll be able to reproduce that from whatever angle you want. Okay, and so um, I'll get into the fine points a little bit of how this is trained in just a second. Maybe it's easier at this point just to show you what I'm going to talk about, just so you can kind of get a feeling for why it's cool. So um, oh, this is just a. I guess I didn't take this. This is like an implicit function picture that you can kind of get a sense of that. OK, so here's like an example of what came out of NERFs, right? So the idea is that I took a bunch of pictures of this flower, and now I'm moving my virtual camera around the NERF, and I'm generating all these new synthetic views. And the cool thing is that this is like a very fine detail 3D object, right? The, the fronds of this plant are very thin. You know, I'm seeing through all these little holes. Like imagining trying to model this thing as a mesh would be just like a huge pain, right? So it was, it was pretty cool that you could do this. Like again, look at this kind of thing, right? The fronds of this palm tree are super detailed and super fine, right? Uh, 
But the other thing that starts to become cool is that, for example, if you look at the reflection of those recycling bins in the background, clearly those, you know, it's not like the, the reflection is like baked into the floor in a way that's the same from any, any viewpoint. It depends on where you're looking at it from, right? Same kind of thing here. Like if you look at the way that the reflections from this window off screen are looking, are, are, are showing on the surface of this piano, right? Clearly this piano has a view dependent, you know, thing that, that is impossible to represent just with a single textured surface alone. And then what kind of blew people's minds was something like this, right? So being able to generate this thing where as you move around this car, you're seeing through the car windows, you know, you're seeing reflections of the trees. There's all this shiny metallic stuff. So typically these kinds of problems are just like hell for normal 3D scanning techniques, right? Where it's impossible to kind of capture all this stuff at once. And so this kind of thing just blew people's minds the first time that they saw it, right? Um, and so that's what it is, right? So let's talk a little bit about just like, okay, so then how do we, how do, we do it? And actually, once you specify the um, representation, it's actually like not crazy hard to, I mean, take the, the initial version of this took like literally days to train for a given scene. So the, again, as with all of this stuff, the first iteration is like super long and then people spend, you know, a few months on it and suddenly it becomes like a five second process, right? So the first version was very chunky, but the, but the idea was there, right? And so let me just say for a second, so once you've got this representation, you know, how do I use it to then back out and generate an image from a new perspective? So, um, you know, if we have this, if we have this representation, how to, you know, create an image from a new perspective. Well, this is a classical computer vision, or I'm sorry, computer graphics problem called volume rendering. So, you know, there's a classic algorithm Um, from computer graphics called volume rendering. Has anyone taken a computer graphics course? One? Yeah. So computer graphics, so, so volume rendering is not the same as ray tracing. So you probably heard of ray tracing in games and stuff, but this is not that, right? Partially because the, we're not representing the 3D object with a surface that we're bouncing reflections off of and going out into light sources. So, so like I said, in some sense, the object is emitting light from all directions. And we're just kind of like integrating how much of that light should reach the camera from a given position, right? So it's kind of like, in a way, the inverse of ray tracing, right? There are, there's only one ray. It's the ray from the camera going out through the image. And so again, you don't have to know a lot of computer graphics to, to understand this, but let me just say that the, the premise is as follows, right? So I'm, I'm basically saying, okay, here's the image that I want to create. I have a camera origin. I have a direction. Let's call it D. I'm shooting that through the image plane at a point X, Y. And my question is, what color should I get at X, Y, right? So now I've got my, you know, 3D world out here. What I do is I kind of specify, like, there's a kind of a closest range and a furthest range out here, like the T near and the T far. And what I do is I am going to basically generate a bunch of points along this ray. And I'm going to find out what are the colors of those points. And I'm going to project those back onto XY. And then I'm going to kind of, as I go back towards the camera, take into account all of the opacities that I have to then kind of downplay that color by, right? So here, this is kind of like a ray that is like, the 3D location of the camera plus some step along the unit vector D, right? And then the um, points along the ray, you know, I've drawn them as if they're like evenly spaced. They're more or less evenly spaced in Nerf. Kind of what's actually happening is that I split up this ray into a bunch of evenly spaced bins and then I randomly sample inside each bin. So it's not like the points themselves are always exactly evenly spaced, but they're always guaranteed to be kind of like within one bin width of each other, basically. And then the uh, color that I get, and let me just put this on a different piece of paper here. So the color at XY 
is an integral from the near bound to the far bound of this value here, which I'm going to specify in just a second. I take the, um, the transmissivity part and the color part dt. So let me just explain this, right? So here, this is like saying my ray at time, you know, this is like uh, r of t, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, this is the uh, color at this point along the ray x, y, z in the direction d, which I got from my nerf if I can evaluate it, right? This here is the volume density at that point. And then this here, I have to tell you what this is. So this here is like the integral of everything I got so far of all of these volume densities. So this is kind of like saying that, OK, suppose that the sigma was equal to 0 all the way along the ray, right? So then this t would be equal to 1, right? Because I'd, I'd be integrating a bunch of zeros. Oh, there should be an exponential here. Uh, I have to actually do exp of all this, sorry. So if, if everything here is 0, then I'm taking e to the 0 is 1, and this t is 1. So that's like saying that fundamentally, you know, if I'm going through free space, then I'm going to just take whatever I get from, you know, from your transmissivity and your color, right? If at some point this sigma is big, then e to the you know, minus infinity is going to be 0. And then this part is going to be 0. I'm going to stop collecting color along the ray. Right? So kind of like saying I'm, I'm going down the ray, and I'm you know, going to keep on accumulating color along the ray until I hit something that's totally opaque, and then I stop. Right? So it's like saying this, uh, this enables me to do things like see through a window. Right? Uh, so maybe I get some sort of color off of a glare on the window, but I keep on going through the window until I hit the wall inside the house. Right? So it's a very cool way of thinking about just like accumulating the transmittance up to a given point, OK? And so again, if you're more of a like visual effects person or a kind of like a computer graphics person, this is also kind of like, um, you know, this is kind of also like what's called alpha compositing. Um, values along the view ray with, again, this only makes sense if you know what alpha compositing is, but. So this is like saying, you know, an alpha mat is basically saying that it's 1 in foreground and 0 in background, right? So you can imagine that I can stack up an image by generating a bunch of partially transparent alpha mats. And so it's just like kind of like 1 minus the transmissivity. So again, don't worry about that too much. So again, if I, if I could make this nerf, this is how I then generate any new image from it. I just do this sampling of x, y, and then I render out the thing from the nerf. And so it's actually pretty straightforward. So how do I actually then optimize the nerf, right? So this, is, this, this works if I have it. But then how do I optimize the nerf? Well. There are a few things that make it work, right? So wh what I'm trying to do is, I'll, as I'll say in a second, I, I need to have a, a loss function that is trying to say that whatever nerf I create has to be consistent with all the images of the scene that I saw, right? So that, that's like the big picture loss function, right? There are some things, obviously, the, some secret sauce that makes this whole thing computationally work, right? So a few key points are that there is you know, a kind of positional encoding that we have to do. So basically, you know, instead of uh, directly passing in these scalar values x, y, z, d, what happens in practice is that we turn those scalar values into vectors, right? So um, we basically have a you know, scale of each of these things into minus 1 to 1, and then we map into a higher dimensional vector, right? So if I'm taking some quantity, let's call this p, I have a mapping, for example, that says 
I take, you know, sine 2 pi, you know, to the 0 power p, cosine 2 pi to the 0 power p, sine 2 pi to the 1 power p, cosine 2 pi to the 1 power p, dot, 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 until I get to cosine of 2 pi to some sort of a, you know, power like this, p. So the idea is that I'm basically increasing my frequency. We've, we've seen this in a bunch of different contexts, right? We saw it in the context of attention. We saw it in the context of, um, what was the other thing? Diffusion, right? So this is a pretty standard like positional embedding to take a scalar and spread out into low frequency to high frequency bins. And so the idea was that for x, y, z values, they did basically 10 levels of frequency. And for the view direction, they use four levels of frequency. So it's a kind of idea. We're using this MLP, and we're trying to make it you know, work at these higher frequencies. So the next thing that made this kind of secret sauce work was this idea of volume sampling. right? So even in this picture, you could see that if there was a lot of free space between my picture and the scene, I could be wasting a lot of time sampling points in totally free space. right? So the idea was that there was also something called hierarchical volume sampling. So hierarchical volume sampling was part of the original Nerf paper. And so the idea is that you know if I'm thinking about kind of shooting a ray out in this direction, and I've got an object that is like here, well, maybe I have some coarse samples that I can think of kind of like, you know, probing the space, right? So I have, uh, you know, these are like what are called coarse samples. And then after I obtain these coarse samples, I look and say, oh, well, actually, um, from this initialization, I could see that maybe I should be concentrating my points around the boundaries of the object, right? I, I should maybe draw these a little bigger. So the stuff that really matters, and again, let me just draw this more interesting. Like, suppose there's like a blob in the middle here. So the stuff that really matters is the, you know, stuff near the uh, kind of like, you know, object boundaries, right? So then I also have, you know, some number of fine samples. And the idea is that the, the coarse samples are roughly equally spaced, and the fine samples are unequally spaced, depending on what I found out about the surface of the object. And so we're kind of optimizing a, you know, what's called a, you know, a coarse network plus a fine network. And I use basically some number of coarse samples plus some number of fine samples. And so just to give you some sense, the original paper used 4K rays per image, and it used 64 coarse samples per ray and 128 fine samples per ray. So kind of the idea is that, you know, I use more fine samples than coarse samples, and I use them all in my, in my, uh, in my ray. And then at the end, the loss function for a given uh, batch is very easy to understand, right? So the loss function is super simple. This is like saying my loss is the sum of all the rays that I have in a batch of training of the difference between the uh, you know, coarse render minus the truth and the fine render minus the truth. So basically, this is like saying this is the result I get from the coarse render. This is the result I get from the fine render. This here is the ground truth that I get from the source images. And so 
The nice thing about this is that, you know, without going into details, everything here is differentiable. The render is differentiable because it's this volume rendering equation. And so actually it turns out that there's really no kind of like computational issues. The original paper used eight fully connected uh, ReLU layers with 256 elements each. It was like a big chunky MLP, right? So that's really like all there is to it. I mean, the paper itself is very easy to read. So if you're interested in the details, you know, the, the Mildenhall original paper is like very easy to follow. Um, so let's just back up for a second though. So there's one big thing I didn't talk about, which is that the assumption is that in order to form this cost function, I need to know where my original pictures were taken from, right? And so when you're moving your camera around a scene, you don't necessarily have a 3D knowledge of where those pictures were acquired from in the first place, right? Like you don't know exactly where you were pointed and exactly where you were located. And that's a critical part of optimizing the nerf. So where does that part come from? So, um, you know, another key issue is we must know where the original images were acquired from. Which is not obvious, right? Um, like, how is it possible to just like walk around the room and then know where your, where your phone was, right? Well, luckily, it is possible. And this is a very classic computer vision problem called structure for motion. So has anyone ever heard of structure for motion? Bundle adjustment? Ready for yeah, camera calibration, right? So this is basically, uh, this is a standard computer vision problem so this is related to camera calibration it's called structure for motion another word for it from the visual effects industry is match moving and so you know it's very standard when you're on a movie set that you want to create 3d versions of things or you want to be able to know where the camera was as it moves through a scene so that you could put like transformers in the scene afterwards and those transformers have to seem like they're sticking to the world, right? So this is a very standard vision problem. Um, and so the original um, Nerf paper used a package called Colmap to do this. This is like the same kind of camera tracking software that they use in the visual effects industry. But again, that has gotten to the point where, um, you know, it's something that you can download yourself and just apply your images to it. And in fact, if you're going to use Nerf yourself, you probably don't even have to go through this first step. It just like does it automatically for you. Just be aware that, you know, if you have a scene that has like really complicated glass and metal and so on, that structure for motion may not work the first time there either, right? So if you're doing this at home, you know, you'll see how, how well the 3D reconstruction works in the first place, right? Um, and so, like I showed you, the first Nerf results were just uh, incredible in terms of like the amount of fine detail they could capture, the re reflectivity, um, you know. So again, just going back to the, you know, picture, like when, when people saw this result, you know, they lost their minds, right? Like, and the other thing that was so incredible about this was that the network weights of the Nerf themselves can be stored super compactly. Like it only takes like five megabytes of memory to store the Nerf to generate whatever image you want. And that's like more data, or that's like less data than one of the original source images in the first place, which seems like impossible to imagine, right? So it's like an extremely clever, compressed way of representing this, the scene. So, um, so basically that paper kind of like took off and started it all. And so um, on the website, I have, apparently I have the wrong website. Uh, okay, let's go back. This one. So on the website, I have the original Nerf paper. Um, this, just an example of how quickly things happen. So this uh, guy here, instant neural graphics primitives is a function called, is a, is a paper called, I think, um, what's it called? Nerf SDF or something like that? Let's just take a look at this. Um, and so this subsequent paper basically, um, oh, instant NGP, that's what it was called. Um, so this instant NGP paper like went from the two days of Nerf optimization to like a 10 second optimization, right? So that's what enables kind of modern Nerf. Uh, and so here's just an, an example of like 
Um, first of all, if you want to learn about this stuff, there is a very nice one-stop shop at Brown for neural rendering fields, including a couple of very nice tutorials that they gave. So you can watch on the website, um, you know, the three hours, you know, CVPR tutorial of, of NERFs, if you want to learn more. There was also a course just at this most recent SIGGRAPH, and they have a very nice survey paper also. And then this very well-known computer vision researcher, Frank Dellert, has a blog of like when NERFs first came out, um, he started to, you know, blog about it. And then if you kind of scroll down, he has a list of like all of these other like NERF related papers. And so, um, you know, then there were like a million papers that were called NERFIES and DNERF and NERF flow and CLIP NERF and NERF CLIP and so on, right? So we'll talk about some of those uh, next time. Um, but, uh, and this was just like right when it came out. And then every year he kind of like did another blog post about, um, you know, fast nerf, diet nerf, uni nerf, you know, kilo nerf, right? So like he kind of did a nice one sentence summary of these various innovations for the past couple of years before I think it became untenable, right? So I think the last time he did it was in 2022. Um, and again, og nerf, ha nerf, HGR nerf, nerf in the dark. So basically, um, I know that for Professor G's class, you're looking for like some sort of like, you know, like nerf ideas. So there, here's where you can get like 100 nerf ideas, you know, from these from these web pages, right? Uh, and and putting them into context, which I think is nice. Um, so the other thing I was going to say is that there is a you know kind of like nice GitHub for if you want to do your own nerfs from scratch. So Nerf Studio is a good place to start, where um, you can just like install the you know GitHub and and start using it. There's a website called 3Studio, which is kind of related to NERFs, but also contains a whole bunch of like other stuff too. Uh, I know Almog is working with this. It's not as easy to use as perhaps it looks. I mean, like some things work out of the box and some things take forever, but it's a good, again, one-stop resource for, actually, this is probably more related to what we're gonna talk about in the next lecture. We're talking about Dream Fusion and this stuff like that. Um, and then what I really wanted to talk about was Luma AI, right? So Luma AI is a, uh, app for your phone. I think it only works on iPhone, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, maybe so. Um, and so if you saw, like I, I saw this come across my feed in the summer, you know, this corridor crew video of these guys using nerfs. Um, this is something where, again, you walk around, you capture, you know, the nerf that you want, and then, um, you know, you just upload it to Luma on your app. I guess it's taking a while for it to download the thing. Uh, and then it just basically works, right? So I would say that for the next uh, homework, you know, either you could use Luma AI like right out of the box and play with it. I'm, not, I'm sorry, these are not loading. I don't know why it's not loading very fast. Um, so there's a great Instagram influencer that I like uh, named Karen X Cheng. And so Karen um, has recently posted these things, which is basically a Luma AI thing. So you stand super still, your friend goes around with a cell phone and you create this 3D environment, you know, kind of just like with one upload to Luma, right? So this is kind of like stationary 3D. You can kind of get a sense of what the 3D object looks like. And just one, while I'm thinking about, you know, one thing that you realize is that the Nerf is not going to be very good at generating kind of like out of view stuff. So you can see there's all this kind of like, you know, the, the center of the bus looks great. And then outside of the bus has got these kind of like weird transparent floatery things. That's very characteristic of Nerf. And there, of course, has been some work on trying to, you know, undo these floaters and so on. Um, here's another great example. Oh, not you, this one. So here again, kind of like standing super still. And then instead of like moving around positionally, she's changing like the effective focal length of the camera, you know, which is something you can also do, right? So um, just kind of like this cool idea of making these awesome like remix videos just for a single thing. One thing that she posted just recently, which I don't think, uh, I don't think I have it here, but I guess we could go to her Instagram page. Um, so, um, let's see. So she is Karen X Cheng. So she just posted this one. So I guess the other thing you could do is you get a party with a bunch of your friends and everyone takes video from their cell phone or maybe just an image from their cell phone and you could do like freeze frame in the air type stuff, right? Which would be hard to do if you're just moving around. So 
if you just watch your you know, Instagram page, you'll find the tutorial for how to do this stuff. So this is what I expect for homework five, is some sort of like awesome Nerf thing, right? Which can be done, I think, without understanding any computer vision or any computer graphics, right? Um, for those of you that are grad students, you have any spare time in the day, you could try using Nerf Studio to do this more directly using, you know, kind of like the grungy GitHub level thing, but certainly it's possible to do with Luma AI um, very easily. So, and, and like I said, there was an immediate flood of, um, you know, Nerf related research that made this whole process super efficient. So I guess one thing I'll say in my notes is that, you know, immediately, basically hundreds of papers on improving, um, you know, size, speed, quality. So there are trade-offs, of course, to make in terms of all these things, right? Uh, and also editability, right? So once you have your nerf, how do you change the nerf, right? So one thing to realize is that lighting is baked into the nerf, right? Um, and, and so is texture and all that stuff, right? So one of the things we'll talk about next time is like, suppose you want to take your nerf of an object and you want to turn it into something that looks like it was made out of Legos, right? So how would you do that? That's kind of like a generative AI version of nerf type stuff. And so um, that's what we're gonna talk about kind of next time is how do we go from the 3D representation, be it point cloud, mesh, whatever, or nerf, into something that is more like generative, right? So now I can say, give me a 3D model of a penguin wearing a top hat you know, I can make that as a point cloud or as a, as a voxel mesh or a voxel grid or as a mesh or as a nerf, right? So we'll talk about a whole bunch of papers for doing that kind of thing uh, next time. So it should be fun. All right, so let me, let me pause and ask because I've been talking for like an hour straight. Any questions or comments about anything I said? I could have paused in the middle, but I was just on a roll. So, yes? Do you know how fast these techniques are? Like, can you render them in real time? Yes, I believe so. So like, I think that this, um, the question is, can we, can we do them in real time? I believe this instant NGP is for all intents and purposes real time. Train a nerf model of a fox under five seconds? Sure you can, right? So uh, if you can train it that fast, then I'm sure that you can render it that fast, right? So, you know, I wouldn't recommend going to uh, the original nerf paper to, to do this homework, right? I would go to a paper like this that is like virtually instant, right? So again, if you're interested in, in kind of like, uh, you know, doing this, then this is a great place to start, right? Um, and again, this SDF stands for Scientist's distance function, right? So that's kind of like the underlying representation um, and there's lots of, of stuff to, to play with. So yes, seems like one good GPU is all you need. All right, other questions or comments? What's the yes. Size of the model? Like how many so let's see. I don't know offhand for this one what the size of the model is. But the whole point was the model is supposed to be small. Uh, yeah, here we go. Nerf looks bad, what can I do here? Call map could be unable to read. So this is like the structure for motion part that's bad. Um, the question is how big is it? Da -da 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 -da. I don't know, well I guess we could look at the paper but I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. But it's not very big, right? So the whole point is that the, the network should not be very huge, I don't think. Randy. So the question is the relationship between NERF and autoencoder, right? So, so let me put a pin in that till next time, right? So in the sense of like the NERF by itself is not like, I wouldn't characterize it as a like latent variable kind of idea, right? It's more like a representation of the object, right? It's like a primitive in a way. And then we could apply an autoencoder to this, for example, right? Like we could, so the, one of the first things we're gonna talk about next time is like, applying an autoencoder to a voxel grid, for example, right? So then you can think about, okay, so then how can I squeeze the relevant stuff out of this into a lower dimensional representation, right? But I wouldn't, I wouldn't personally characterize the NERF as the same type of thing as an autoencoder, if that makes sense. Okay, all right, so with that, I'm gonna stop the lecture, but before you get going,